<laughs> and we've been able to target some of these. And this was really helpful in the first uh, lockdown, where we were able to, to look at our patient list, see our patients who maybe had, say, bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, and offer them proactive help. And actually, whenever our mental health worker started doing that, she found out that some of them were struggling. And so she was able to put in interventions before they got to crisis stage. And this is so important. So we definitely feel, you know, community care is great. Community care is, is where patients want to go. And frequently with patients with mental health disorders and anxiety, to travel long distances to maybe a, a hospital appointment or something, it's very difficult for them. Uh, many of them are on low incomes uh, and to get buses and things like that, and particularly from where I am, which is a rural community in Kilkeel, it can be very difficult. So, so we see as community care being best care, uh, and we're very keen, you know, to support this. And we heard, you know, from Siobhan there talking about the Mental Health Action Plan. You can see the MDT model is, is, is really firmly in there, you know, 10.2, 10.3, 10.4, uh, and how we support it and work together. So very happy to take any questions on it. Yeah, no, that sounds brilliant. It sounds like a really proactive approach you have taken then. Um, I was just wondering, what sort of, um, who is your um, mental health um, person? Is that a counsellor? Is that... So, so mental, health, mental health practitioners can be employed from a different number of different roles, actually. So, so okay. the criteria we've set out is that they can be a, a traditional you know, community psychiatric nurse, or they can be a social worker, or they can be a psychotherapist. Now, ours just happens to be, a, 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 you know, previously was the CPN, a community psychiatric nurse. Uh, and so she, but it's been fantastic having her because she has really good understanding of the mental health system. Uh, and, and that's just been fantastic. It's really important to remember as well that these people work under the same roof as us. Uh, so if there's another condition that, that needs maybe a medical thing, I, I'm just down the corridor and she can knock my door. And so if it's issues about medication, about prescribing, or in fact other health conditions, because we know that people who have mental health problems have a higher incidence of, of other um, medical conditions. And actually evidence shows that those haven't been had the, the good attention that they should have. So people with mental health, significant mental health, are much more likely to smoke, they're much more likely to die younger, they're much more likely to have cardiovascular disease. So she's able, if she has maybe a patient with significant mental health issues and she goes, this person needs their blood pressure reviewed or they need something medical as well, she could knock my door and together we work as a partnership. And uh, so it's a really good way of, of collaborative work and we're, we're very supportive of it. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. I'm sure that's having a really positive impact on your patients then. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask you one more question, then we'll have to move on. Um, I know typically that a GP consultation only lasts about 10 minutes. Um, and I just, I know this is probably quite controversial, but I just wanted to ask you, um, do you think that's enough time to help someone that has just come in for the first time to you and they have a really struggling, they have really poor mental health? Um, do you think something should be done to improve that or um, is um, like using your other colleagues um, in the multidisciplinary team, is that helping? Sort of yeah, so, so that's a really good question. So it is, and actually the Royal College of GPs have, have advocated for 15 minute appointments for quite a long time now. You say 10 minutes, it actually turns out to be about seven minutes by the time you get called somebody from a waiting room and they walk in and sit down and so on. And anybody who want, who, who knows, you know, do, uh, to, to treat mental health, mental health properly, it takes time, it takes kindness, it takes, you know, we need to give people space to talk. Uh, and so quite frequently, if, if we have an unexpected uh, mental health condition, that everything else gets knocked behind. We, we do have that, that ability, you know, to, to, to lengthen our appointments, but it does take time. The, the mental health workers, they're not a substitute for, for GPs, but they're, I mean, they're truly a collaboration. They're another part of the team that can help. And, and it's been a big thing for GPs to admit that there are people who can do a lot of jobs better than us. Uh, and again, these mental health workers, they can do it. They have certain skills that we don't have, but we're definitely greater than the sum of our parts. It's a really good model. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Norman, for sharing your insight on behalf of GPs there. Um, so I think now we're going to move on to our mental health social worker. So that's Sharon Rutherford. Hello, Sharon. I think you're on mute still, just. Sorry, hello. Hello. Um, so Sean, we'll start with you. Um, I just wanted to ask you first of all, could you explain to us more about um, what your role involves and how you support people with mental health conditions? Okay, well I've been a mental health social worker for nearly over 20 years now in a variety of roles and over time it has expanded and my experience has expanded. I currently work in the home treatment team in Southeastern Trust. Now it's a multidisciplinary trust that works over seven days of the week um, 
every day of the year, um, be, uh, made up of consultant psychiatrists, specialty doctors, so mental health social workers, nurses, occupational therapists, pharmacists and support workers. We aim to um, provide support for those who are facing acute mental health distress and who with intensive support can be prevented from being admitted to a psychiatric ward. We also facilitate early step down from a psychiatric ward for those who can be treated safely in the community. One of the parts that we have to be very careful of is when somebody is in acute distress, often there's an escalation of risk to themselves or to others, and we have to be able to manage that safely. One of the vital parts of our role will be the team working approach. And I will always say my job is based in a work family where we rely heavily on each other for support to be able to ensure that we can keep someone safe at home. Our involvement can be short term um, and tends to be very intensive daily visits, reducing it as and when somebody improves and um, until they are referred on to onward services or um, discharged from the service and no lo longer need follow up. Um, it's, uh, I'm trying to think now in terms of, we, we can transfer to um, community mental health team services for longer term support. That's brilliant, Sharon, thank you so much. It's so nice to hear how much you value the multidisciplinary team um, in your work. Um, I know as well that you're an approved social worker. Could you explain to us what that means? Okay, so I'm also, um, it's hard speaking in these Zoom meetings, but I am also an approved social worker. And basically for the last 16 years, I've been trained as a specialist social worker who's involved in the assessments under the mental health order. That would be working alongside a GP when we're called to respond to a situation where there's deemed to be somebody who has a mental illness and there's a significant risk of harm to themselves or others. We assess them to see if they meet the grounds to be um, detained to hospital and for those individuals who are refusing to accept that there's a clinical need that they need admitted but also they may not have the capacity to make that informed decision and therefore need the legislation to support and protect their human rights going forward. And as part of that approved social work um, role, I'm involved in the Mental Capacity Act panels, the partial implementation of the deprivation of liberty. And I would sit as a chair as an ASW in those panel applications. Thank you, Sharon. Um, we'll just ask you one more question. Um, Given your experience working in the mental health sector um, for a number of years now, what do you think are the challenges that you still see? I'm sure a lot has changed, but what do you still think should be improved? Okay, well, this is, this is a real hobby horse of mine because I think over the years, the best thing that has improved has interagency working and the way we connect with other services. And actually, I have to be honest and say COVID has enhanced that significantly so. Whenever um, the first lockdown occurred, we had to merge with another service, our mental health assessment centre. And during that time, you really got an understanding of their resource pressures, their roles, and actually we had to fill in those roles and they had to fill in ours. As a result of that, the transition between those services is second to none now. And I will say my um, links with those colleagues has really improved. And the multi-agency triage team, which you'll hear about later, um, has also enhanced the relationship between paramedics and police ongoing and educationally, as well as getting to know the individuals we're working with. And as an approved social worker and in home treatment team, I have come across those partnerships that I have built in those other roles. And that is something that we will always need more of, understanding the pressures and resource limitations that everybody else is facing and working together is going to always improve the service. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Sharon. And I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this interview today was to bring people together and sort of hear people's different perspectives because there is so much to learn just by talking to different professionals. So thank you so much, Sharon, for um, being here today. Um, so I think we're going to move now um, to Ship and Lifeline. So I'll like Aidan take over for this. Thanks, Emily. Um, so next we're going to go over to Grace Heinemann. Um, Firstly, Grace, I'll just ask you who you are, um, where you came from today, what is SHIP, you know, and how does it fit into mental health care provision here? 
Okay, well, thank you all for the invite. It's lovely to be here today. So I'm Grace and I work for the charity Inspire Wellbeing and we have the contract for SHIP for the Southern Trust and the Southeastern Trust. SHIP is a regional service that's provided throughout the province. So public health agencies commissioned different charities to provide SHIP in the different trust areas. So what SHIP is, we're a counselling programme for individuals with self-harm and behaviour and we accept referrals for 11 year olds and above. I know today strictly we're strictly here to talk about adults but um, that's our lower um, age range so we provide um, a short counselling model for clients who have self-harm and behaviours or thoughts of self-harm um, dependent on the trust area is dependent on where we receive our referrals from but from seeing some of the teams that I work with on here today, the like of Sharon and her team within home treatment would refer in to us. Um, we also would receive referrals in from the multidisciplinary practitioners and the GP surgeries as well. And the MAP team also refer in to us as well. So when a client is referred in to us, we um, telephone them within 24 hours and their first counseling appointment is arranged within seven days. Obviously, owing to the pandemic, all um, counseling has taken place via telephone and video call um, and we have actually seen a really high level of engagement in that um, we've a lot less um, DNA rates and I know that's the same for Lifeline as well when we have been in meetings with with themselves so um, we also then our 11 year olds I suppose are strictly only referred from CAMS but our adult clients are referred from a, a range of other statutory services all that we have a strict eligibility criteria um, and all clients must have a mental health assessment before being referred to Ship. Um, that was actually just my next question. I was just going to ask if there was any sort of you know, self referral pathway or if there was, you know, what was the criteria for being referred to yourselves? Okay, well, um, as we're commissioned by the Public Health Agency, they outline our eligibility criteria and all clients must have a mental health assessment. Um, clients cannot be availing of long-term follow-up from trust services. So if somebody's engaged with a community mental health team for a long period of time, they're not eligible for SHIP. Um, we also, clients must have um, engaged in active self-harm or plans to self-harm. Um, and clients um, must, in terms of, I suppose, um, addiction and alcohol and drug dependency, the clinician should use their clinical judgment. And, um, you know, if somebody is daily dependent on alcohol, you know, are they cognitively ready to uh, um, engage in counselling with SHIP? So those are sort of the, the key aspects to our um, eligibility criteria. Clients can, you know, maybe have a mild to moderate mental health diagnosis, but not a severe and enduring mental health diagnosis. That's great, Chris. Thank you very much for that. No problem. And you had said that you were linked into Lifeline, so I think that's a good place to go next. So if I could get James Gallagher to unmute, it would be great. He seems to have frozen. That's okay, sure. We can come back to him anyway. Um, some, maybe some technical issues. Uh, Chris Clark, if you wouldn't mind unmuting, we can move on to that one next. So we can start off with um, what your profession is and how you would be involved with mental health care services. Uh, yeah, my profession obviously is the ambulance service. Uh, working with NIAS for about 20 years, involved in nursing before that. Um, and as the ambulance service is on a journey from a vocation to a profession, and I see Jenny is on the panel here as well, um you know it's quite a transition and that traditional model of where we responded to somebody lifted them on a chair stuck them in the back of the ambulance and then took them into ed for the doctors to sort them out that isn't the model anymore um and not only in mental health but in frailty falls all the range of mental health or range of 99 calls that we go to so linking in um which uh so I already spoke about linking in with other healthcare professionals and how we manage people correctly and using the limited resources that we have more skillfully right across the piece, you know, and how we manage these people and manage them correctly the right time, the first time, you know, that's why the involvement and then with the likes of Matt is very important for us that we can link into services, linking in with Lifeline, which we have as well, or for our pathway, 
you know, there's different avenues that we can now direct the patient. And um, one of the things going forward, probably if you look at some of the NHS improvement models, is having that mental health practitioner actually within the control room and meeting that call at the first point of contact and then linking in with the other services. Um, and there's a lot of data coming out from NHS England, NHS improvement, how we can manage those individuals better. But part of that is knowing and understanding and having those relationships with the other services and thinking this is this is right, this is the patient needs to go here. And as Dr. Lawrence already said, you know, going through the GP is possibly not the right route the first time, but actually directing that patient to the service that's suitable for them and appropriate for them. Right, that's great. Thank you very much. Um got a question there about um calls. So approximately if you were to you know, make an estimate. How many of your calls do you think would be mental health related? And has that changed in the past year, year and a half? Um, believe not, COVID for us over the last year and a half, we've had a, a fairly, um, it varies, but upward until about 21% drop of 99 calls per day. And um, our call volume has gone down. Um, but conversely to that is our level of the acuity of the patient has gone up. We're getting sicker calls and sicker patients, and you've know, all seen on the news in relation to the ANEs trying to wait to get the patient into ANE. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, whenever I was doing night shift on a Friday night, you know, I waited outside the Royal for an hour to get a patient into the hospital, and we had only a third of our vehicles on. So if we'd have had our full complement on, I'd have probably been waiting there all night, and that's not good. And if you think about it, if you have a patient, I mean, we're talking about mental health. If you have the patient back of an ambulance who's maybe in a wee bit of crisis, you know, heightened state, sitting inside the back of an ambulance for four hours, four hours outside in any department is not how to manage that individual. You know, and that's that's the challenge that we have. Um, and whenever we encounter those patients with, with mental health difficulties. Right, that's great, thanks. Um, obviously, I'm sure you probably agree that that would be an obstacle to providing effective care for those patients. Do you think that there's any other curves or any other, sorry, obstacles in your profession to provide an effective care for patients with mental health conditions? Absolutely. Probably the biggest thing of all is education of our own staff. Do you know, traditionally we had very limited um, education of paramedics in relation to mental health and mental wellness and everything else, do you know, so We've always very much concentrated on trauma and all these sort of things, but actually the, the psychological components, and this is the change, if you like, where we go from that vocation to a profession and branching out and having a broader understanding and actually almost then having what services we can sign that patient to appropriately with a bit of, bit of patient assessment and linking in with the subject matter experts and maybe having a telephone call to the mat and referring a patient over to Matt and say, here's a patient who can assess the patient better than us. And it's having those networks. That's how we deliver appropriate care. That's great, Chris. Thank you very much for that. Um, I can see James has came back on. Uh, so we're going to move on to Lifeline. So thank Chris again. Um, James, if you just want to introduce yourself, introduce Lifeline, give a bit of an overview uh, as to Lifeline's kind of position in mental health healthcare. Thanks, Aidan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Apologies. As typical, my Wi Fi completely dropped there just as it was coming around to me, and it wasn't pretty at this end of the camera. Um, so, my name is James Gallagher. I'm a team leader with the Lifeline service. Um, I suppose my specific role is sort of as like a clinical, managerial, sort of consultative, supervisory sort of um, overview where we sort of focus on client and patient care um, through the Lifeline service itself. Um, Lifeline's a, a regional crisis counseling service. It's, um, its pr primary function really is a 24 7 uh, crisis helpline. And that's managed by counselors and therapists that provide a safe contained space for individuals experience a sort of personal crisis. It's a free phone number and we aim to answer 100% of calls into the lifeline service within five seconds. So, and, you know, in that immediate sort of response to anybody across the region. 
Um, the way in which our service works, we undertake a, a collaborative uh, review of all individual uh, patient or client needs to establish how best Lifeline can support that individual. That can often look um, like a number of various ways that include things such as uh, short term um, therapeutic packages where some of our counselling and therapists will provide up to six weeks of individual counselling and therapy. Uh, similar to my colleague uh, from SHIP, Grace, uh, we have uh, transitioned into the telephone and virtual space given the pandemic. And as uh, Grace said, we're noticing you know, significant uptake in relation to attendance rates as well. And we also, I suppose, offer other outreach services as well. Uh, we have a proactive um, a sort of outreach programme, which we refer to as check-ins. And these are sort of um, um, tailor for individuals who are determined that immediate or ongoing suicide risk or self-injurious behaviour where we want to make sure that we are keeping constant contact and as part of their sort of collaborative safety plan. So uh, individual consent and um, empowerment in relation to that plan is really important from a, an individual strengths-based coping strategy, if that makes sense. Um, hopefully I've answered the question there and I've stopped flustering about my Wi-Fi. So. <laughs> well, that's that on. Thanks very much. Um, I would just ask about, in terms of the MDT, we've spoken about it with uh, a couple of others in the interview panel. Um, how does Lifeline interact with other members of the MDT? Yeah, so I suppose in a, in a number of various ways. So we would have quite close um, links and relationships with the GP practices. Um, so for, for instance, anybody who refers in to the, the Lifeline service, um, what we would look to do is build a comprehensive picture in relation to how we're going to support that individual. And one of the, the sort of primary questions that we'll ask in relation to who is their registered GP. Um, our contact with the likes of the GP, for instance, can vary from a confirmation letter that we're providing a particular aspect of support to a phone call uh, if there's you know, more immediate or pressing concerns in relation to a case review. And we'd also work closely with um, primary mental health teams uh, based at a number of the assessment centers and things like that, uh, where we would sort of share information in relation to uh, treatment plans to ensure that we're not doing anything sort of counterintuitive to the sort of therapeutic approach that maybe um, like a, a mental health team or recovery team or a personality disorder team or whatever that might be is involved in the individual's plan. Um, we would attend sort of uh, risk strategy meetings, if you like, in relation to making sure that we are uh, part of the, the patient or client's journey to ensure that you know, we're, again, um, supporting you know, our experience of the individual and making sure that we're working in the same direction and aligned to the individual's recovery. Um, and I suppose we would um, sort of try and straddle the sort of statutory community voluntary sector in relation to sort of suicide prevention strategy and make sure that we're sort of, you know, uh, connecting with people on the, the front line on the ground in the sort of community um, um, organizations who, you know, are really there as the, the representative in that local area. You know, we want to make sure that you know, we're sort of um, working alongside and aligned with uh, individuals from that sector as well. Great, James, thank you very much for that. Um, we will move on next to our Chief Allied Health Persons Officer, Jennifer King. Uh, good morning, um, good morning. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, Aidan. Not a problem. Um, the first question I would ask would be more in at AHPs in general, um, then I can kind of ask you about your role. Um, so I would ask, how do you, the AHPs influence mental health care provision here? Um, okay, Aidan, um, I suppose the allied health professions are a very broad family of professions. Um, we have, you know, 13 in total in Northern Ireland and seven of those are commissioned directly within the health and social care service. Um, a number of things already mentioned, sort of, so two of our bigger initiatives at the moment is the allied health profession input both to the multidisciplinary teams and primary care as Dr Dorman has talked about the mental health worker. Um, the, other, the other area is influencing into the mental health strategy, the CAM, increased support in CAMs. Um, so, so, so those initiatives are, are, are really, really important. But across the allied health professions there are a number of sort of key non-medical interventions where the allied health professions really provide support um, and I'm thinking really about advocating and providing services 
that promote the importance, for example, of physical activity and physical well-being to overall mental health well-being. Um, thinking about the impact of poor communication or where individuals with limited communication or difficulty in communication, the impact that has on mental health, both from an early years perspective, but taking that through adult life um, and a lot of work with our speech and language therapists, for example, in youth justice and in adult justice. Um, again, uh, the importance of the link between mood and food um, and our dietitians are very involved both at the sort of the acute end with um, eating disorders um, and that acute inpatient um, piece, but wider in the public health agenda um, and wider across a number of programs about behaviour management um, and, 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 uh, and that's a part and the impact of people's mood and their relationship with food. Um, the more traditional thoughts in terms of allied health professions are, is around occupational therapy um, and in trying to support people to engage with meaningful daily activity and daily occupation. And there's a real strong history of occupational therapy working with um, patients within um, institutional mental health facilities, but wider within primary and secondary care to promote and support people back to independent living. Um, increasingly, I have, um, well, not increasingly, but I have, a, I have a real passion for the professions which we don't immediately think of, those that aren't within the health and social care system at the moment. Um, I call them our creative therapies. So those are the art, music and drama therapists who increasingly are having a really valid and important role to play in trauma um, and in recovery. Um, their role was particularly highlighted in Nightingale in London um, in supporting particularly families and young people um, through the creative, medium, cre creative mediums um, in that trauma support. So, and I hope that gives you a bit of a, a, an overview of where, where, where the allied health professions are within the overall mental health work. Yeah, that's great, Jenna. I would just ask you, um, how much importance would you place on you know, working within that MDT? Uh, obviously, the AHPs are normally grouped together and kind of at its core, AHPs work together to create an outcome. So how much importance would you place on the MDT for AHPs? Yeah, I mean, I think MDT working and the transformation that is happening right across primary care at the moment is really showing really positive dividends. Um, yes, I would, you know, the mental health worker is, is in that space, but I would also look at, towards my paramedic colleagues and I see Chris, and I've seen Chris on the call um, and the importance of other professions potentially within primary care and within that MDT working um, to improve not just mental health but physical health and as I've already said you know improving physical health and well-being impacts on mental health I, I don't think we can completely separate them both um, but the MDT working is vital um, it, it really um, I think having allied health professions within that wider multidisciplinary team not just doesn't just bring the benefits of that individual profession. So within the mental health worker, it's, it's occupational therapy, but then that brings with them access to other parts of the, M the AHP MDT, which then you know, informs the wider primary care MDT. So as an ethos, it's definitely a, a, an important direction of travel. Um, and I, I don't think you'll find anybody across Northern Ireland from service users to those that deliver the service that would advocate for anything other than, than that approach. Well, that's great. And just for, you know, more yourself on a personal level as the Chief ASP Officer, um, is there any projects or anything that you're kind of looking forward to at the minute um, in terms of mental health that is going on or going to be going on in the next number of years? Yeah, well, I suppose my, my main role, Aidan, and as a, the Chief HP Officer is to inform policy development, not just within health, but across um, all policy developments with really, you know, with, with the very high aim of trying to improve um, population health and well-being for all of our population across Northern Ireland. 
Um, obviously, the one of the more exciting um, strategies at the moment is definitely the mental health strategy. But the other, you know, very immediate policy and strategy is the reform and rebuild of health and social care as a consequence of COVID. Um, and mental health is core to that. Um, and it is already, you know, it is embedded right across all of all of the all of the strands of recovery. Um, it, it's my role to ensure that the offer from the allied health professions is understood and is understandable to all of the other policy leads, um, and and to ensure that they, you know, they have an awareness that, that they have an awareness of it. Um, and then the the other side of my role, which impacts. It, you know, impacts and works with the with the mental health agenda is commissioning of education. Um, and my colleague Chris has already mentioned that um, in terms of the importance of it. So my office has responsibility for commissioning undergraduate places, but also the postgraduate um, education. So in terms of undergraduate, I think it's it's really important that we have you know the adequate numbers and types of professions coming in graduating that can help to provide capacity and capability to improve mental health. But further back from that, it's around the curriculums and being able to influence with the regulators to ensure that there is adequate mental health within all of the undergraduate curricula. Um, and then at postgraduate level, ensuring that there are opportunities and career pathways available to all professions so that the importance of mental health continues throughout the and a practitioner's lifetime learning. That's great, Jenny. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, we will just move on to the next part. Sudi Lemfesti. I could be saying that wrong. Apologies if I am. Um, if you'd just like to introduce yourself, introduce your profession, and where your profession fits into mental health care provision. Yeah, no, the pronunciation was perfect, thanks. Um, so I'm Susie, I'm an emergency medicine trainee. Um, I'm currently working in the Southeastern Trust in the Ulster Emergency Department. Um, I've been working in NE for the last five years or so in different trusts and across the border in Scotland as well. That's great. And how on your day to day, how many, you know, interactions do you think you would have with mental health corporations and, you know, how do you deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so I suppose percentage-wise in terms of presentations to the emergency department will vary sort of trust to trust. And there's figures from sort of 5% of presentations will be to do with mental health, maybe a bit more. Um, I suppose with, with the emergency department, and um, I think everyone here will agree it's the last place really that, that you want a mental health patient to be if they don't need to be there in terms of how it is for the patient in terms of patient experience. Um, probably about two thirds of our mental health presentations will be out of hours as well, um, which provides another layer of challenges. Um, often when patients get to the emergency department, they may be in an extreme situation in terms of point of crisis. Um, it may be their last um, sort of place that they've, they've been able to come to. Um, the you know PSNI may may have been phoned out about them, or they may have been an ambulance may have been phoned because there's a physical element to to their mental health problem now, um, and that's kind of maybe the the more extreme end of the spectrum is more what we're we're maybe seeing. Yeah, that's great. And following on from the MDT theme that we are kind of running through. Right? Um, how much interaction would you have with other members of the MDT and who would you interact with? Yeah, so I think um, I'm not going to speak for all emergency medicine doctors, but I would say in terms of confidence in, in what we can provide for a patient with mental health problems, you know, we're more than happy to see these patients and make an assessment, but we heavily rely on our colleagues for further advice on, on the best way to manage um, many situations. So most emergency departments now will have a liaison psychiatry team who we can give a call most hours of the day with limited funding and, and things. Sometimes that service is stopped at midnight, um, but in most places we can access that at any stage. 
Um, so obviously we take advice from them and most of the time they'll happily come and assess the patient as well and try and make a plan from there. Um, we've also got a social worker in the department um, who again isn't there 24 hours a day but we can always access social work and if we need to, you know, if we feel someone may need um, an assessment for detention, we can, we can contact an approved social worker and GP out of orders and things as well. So, um, I mean, the MDT team to us is everything and all the patients we see, but in particular in, in mental health. Yeah, that's great. And just finally, I would ask you, the ED has been, it's had kind of a reputation of not being the most welcoming place for patients with mental health conditions. With some patients having to be escorted by police. Um, how do you think the emergency department could be made into a safer space for the patients to make them feel a bit more comfortable? Yeah, it's a really tricky one and um, the global pandemic has not helped the situation. Um, prior to COVID, um, there was guidance released, well updated guidance released in 2019 by the College of Emergency Medicine and um, part of that guidance kind of dictates what we should be doing as nurses and doctors in the emergency department, but also there should be a mental health lead in the department. There should be a dedicated space for these people to have a proper mental health assessment. And um, I'm sure as anyone that's been in any department or, or the likes of Chris working for NIAS, I mean, space is, is really limited and a place away from noise and um, even if the patient isn't being brought up by the PSNI there's often police officers there with other patients and um, it's busy and um, it's hard to prioritize and um, everyone's now in masks and it is really really difficult and uh, you know it's really hard for the patients and it's difficult to know how to improve that I think we were probably going the right direction pre-COVID um, but things are definitely extreme at the minute um, and, and that's becoming tricky. But what I would say is I think community services and um, so the liaison services have definitely upped their game and actually keeping patients away from the emergency department unless they need to sort of be there has, has probably been the key at the minute. But I think looking to the future and post-COVID, um, making sort of space for, for a proper mental health assessment nearly unit in the emergency department away from, from all the drama of, of the resource area and things like that, you know, would be amazing. But um, yeah, at the minute we have a long way to go, I would say. Yeah, I think uh, COVID's affected a whole lot of plans in terms of healthcare provision. But thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Emily. Yeah, so um, we're going to move now from emergency services back to sort of community services. So um, we're going to bring on Gareth Gilvari from CPNI. Um, Gareth, hello. Hi, I wasn't expecting you to come to me there. I thought I was going to Mark, so I was kind of oh, um, okay. relaxed. Just no, so you're talking about the police, I'm, I'm happy to speak. I just. Okay. Sure. No, um, we're going to do pharmacy and then dentistry and then we're going to come to the place last. So, um, Gareth, if you could just explain for everyone um, what your job role is and then maybe go into how community pharmacy can support patients with mental health conditions, please. Okay, well, firstly, like, thank you very much for helping me. My name is Dr. Gareth Galvari. I'm a community pharmacist. Um, I spent some time in academia. And then at the beginning of this pandemic, um, as you can imagine, there was a call to arms in community pharmacy, sorry, turned to practice. Um, and I currently work now for the CPNI. It's a representative body and um, negotiating with the Department of Health on behalf of community pharmacists. Um, in terms of what community pharmacy could do to advance, um, you know, mental health care um, in Northern Ireland, I suppose one thing that, <clears throat> and this applies for everybody on this panel, um, you know, things have definitely changed for community pharmacy. Uh, but one thing that is, I think, or certainly I am definitely biased, um, one thing that's unique for community pharmacy is, um, generally speaking, you know, we are open sort of morning, noon and night. Um, you'll see across the whole of Northern Ireland, there's 528 pharmacies. Um, and generally speaking, um, at a town centre, you know, it's right in the town centre. Everybody knows the community pharmacist and it is a, 
um, healthcare professional that you can walk in without an appointment and, um, and speak to somebody. Um, obviously not as highly trained as some of my other fruit and friends here, but um, definitely um, in terms of accessibility, probably uh, one of the most accessible um, healthcare professionals on, um, on the high school in, in the community, I guess. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question or not. No, that's a brilliant introduction, Gareth. Thank you. Um, could you tell us some more about how, um, in typically your day-to-day -day work as a community pharmacist, how would a community pharmacist um, sort of interact or support patients um, that are coming in with a mental health condition, like the different ways that a pharmacist could do that? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I think most people are aware of what you know the core role for community pharmacies at the moment is the safe and effective dispensing of medicines from a prescriber. Typically, um, general practitioners like um, like Lauren Storman, um, not specifically all GPs, um, but that that would be the core role for pharmacists. However, um, like I said, in terms of accessibility, it is one of those things that, um, especially now with lockdown, I, I won't get into it too much. But um, you know, people are are experiencing quite literally a once in a lifetime experience and. Um, maybe being cooped up at home, working from home, not being able to see their friends. And that is having an effect that certainly now that with this lockdown and, and certainly back in, in March 2020, um, really the only places that were open to go into were supermarkets and pharmacies. And that, that you could walk into, I appreciate that other places could be accessed. Um, and I think for a lot of people, I think that really uh, became an outlet because Sometimes, and this is this is not backed up by anything other than my own personal experience. But sometimes people wanted just to just to see somebody they knew, somebody they knew as a health professional, and just to just to um, you know just just to have an ear to listen. I think community pharmacies um, could do that, um, and I, I think I, well, I, I, not that I think I know that's that's what I did. Um, I don't know if that answers your question either. I don't know if I'm answering any of these questions, to be honest no, with you. No, but... that's absolutely brilliant. You're painting a really good picture of community pharmacy here. Um, just to touch on something else, so Siobhan O'Neill mentioned, and a few people here have referenced it as well, the new mental health strategy mm -hmm. for Northern Ireland um, has really put an emphasis on the importance of community services. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, you know, community pharmacies are literally in the heart of most towns and villages in Northern Ireland. So looking to the future, um, how do you see um, community pharmacists becoming more involved in helping people, um, be that in sort of promoting good public health messages about mental health or anything else? How do you see the sort of service change? In the um, I, think, I think ultimately um, the service will change and community pharmacists were um, you know, we're typically just somewhere where you went for minor ailments and for uh, to have your prescription filled. Um, at the moment, certainly in the short term, we're experiencing things that, um, sadly, you know, maybe maybe we're always um, underlying, but um, I've really come to the fore. For example, um, and I only I only <laughs> I only mention this because it's quite a hot topic right now. But um, you know, there has been an increase in, for example, domestic abuse. You know, people spending a lot more time at home and, and what sort of effect that is not just having on their, their own mental health, but, you know, their, their own um, safety and environment. Um, there's a new scheme that, you know, community pharmacies has developed and, and ask for any scheme, you know, um, action needed immediately. And I'm sure some of my other um, in SHIP and in Lifeline could probably talk a little bit more about that than I, but things like that where, you know, you can walk in and, and get that help um, most immediately. Um, but other things in terms of um, we're seeing things that, you know, maybe certainly I, I spent a lot of time in academia and, and it's not something I've ever seen before where um, you're having skepticism about uh, facts that um, and that certainly my sort of type A personality doesn't you know, quite compute. So things like a living world scheme that community pharmacy runs right now. Um, obviously, vaccines are a huge hot topic right now, thankfully. Um, God, God knows that I am thankful, but um, you're having people now presenting where they're they're unsure or they're a little bit anxious, um, you know, about vaccines. And you know, it's very easy to say, "Oh no, it's it's grand," but to actually have sit down and have our conversations and, and provide that safe information from a reputable source from a healthcare professional, 
and I think I think community pharmacies are, are based in a, a perfect position to do that. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think there's so much you can do around um, patient education in terms of safety of vaccines, in terms of if somebody's starting a new medication or something, there's so much opportunity to really... Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think you're right, Emily. I think that, um, you know, I, I certainly think of it as a, you know, we're all cogs in the same wheel. Um, and I'm, I'm sure Dr. Dorman can speak a bit more about this, but, you know, in terms of starting somebody on medication, you know, I'd, I'd love to... I'd love to have 15 minutes per patient, but sometimes it can run, up, run on a little bit and, and sometimes that is necessary where you're seeing, you're seeing for, for example, um, you're seeing things now where people with, with complex needs, but also complex medication histories, um, no shielding and now can't get their medicine and potentially starting something or coming off something or um, again, not getting into this, but you know, potential now um, post EU exit to have maybe a medicine shortage um, I seen a letter yesterday from, um, oh goodness, I can't even remember, but it was, it was from the Department of Health that you know, stoma care, for example, um, is now going to be affected because of, of um, EU exit and, and that anxiety that, that anxiety that it's bringing on patients is, 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 it can be, as you can imagine, it can be quite frightening. So, um, and I think the community pharmacy really can, with, with everybody else, like nobody is the one master of this, uh, can really push it forward. Yeah, completely agree, Gar. Thank you so much um, no for coming this morning. Um, so we're going to move on now to Roz McMahon. Um, Roz, you are a dentist. Um, could you um, maybe introduce your job role now and um, just talk about sort of the link between dentistry and promoting good mental health? Uh, good, good morning and thank you for having me. Um, I'm Ros McMullen. Um, uh, in my day job, I was uh, a consultant orthodontist in the Western Trust. I'm now retired from that, but I'm now the well-being lead for the British Dental Association in the UK wide. Um, and uh, I also chair a group here in Northern Ireland, which some of my colleagues in the panel will have heard of called Probing Stress and Dentistry. Um, and um, thank you for having me. You asked me specifically about the role of dentists uh, and um, the, the first thing to note is that like community pharmacists, our footfall is really quite high. Uh, so we actually see more individual patients than general medical practitioners. They have more repeat performers. We have a chance to see more individuals within families. Um, and um, we also see people when they're so-called well. So we have an opportunity to see disease at an early stage how can we see that? Well, obviously coming to a dentist, um, mood disorders can be accentuated coming to a dentist and we can perceive uh, inappropriate behaviours from that point of view. You can see oral manifestations of uh, uh, mental health disorders, uh, particularly addiction and certainly domestic abuse. Um, as an orthodontist, I was in a, a, a position to notice uh, young people with eating disorders when you lie down in a dental chair it becomes uh, very quickly apparent so we may be actually the first people to pick up on mental health disorders so it's about opening those conversations uh, it's about asking are you all right um, it is about safe signposting and, and moving people uh, towards uh, safe services and perhaps picking up things at an early stage that's brilliant, Ross. Well, thank you. Um, it's really interesting to hear that perspective because um, it's not necessarily a link that you would immediately make like dentistry and mental health conditions, but you've explained it really, really well there. Um, the next question I want to ask you is about when you do notice um, that someone might be struggling with their mental health, what do you do? Is there a clear sort of pathway or um, how would you get other people involved to get that person help? Historically, the pathway would have been to the general medical practitioner. We have uh, strong links with our GP colleagues. Uh, we already know our medical histories of most of our patients. We've known the families, so we know the, the family settings. So historically, that would have been to the general medical practitioner. Um, we, going back to my role as chair of probing stress and dentistry, one thing we have been doing in Northern Ireland, we've been blazing a bit of a trail because it's now starting on a UK-wide basis. And this is about developing mental health leads uh, or champions, however you like to call them, within the dental workplace. Now, that's not just general dental practices. It could be community dental services where they are seeing families which are particularly disadvantaged or the hospital dental services. 
um, but to have a, a mental health lead. Um, and this is as described by the health and safety executive, somebody with mental health awareness training, which uh, we encourage all members of the dental team to have mental health awareness team in that training. And that is available to all registrants free of charge through the British Dental Association. You don't have to be a member of the BDA to get that. Mental health first aid. And uh, we're also uh, very um, not lucky because it's a lot of hard work and that NIMDATA here in Northern Ireland provides suicide prevention training for our structured training, which of course is the, the one evidence-based uh, training to all doctors and dentists in Northern Ireland. And they, pre-COVID, that's there's a bit of a halt on it at the minute, pre-COVID they, they ran a number of those <coughs> through the Safe Talk, the, the Canadian resource. Um, so to have mental health first aiders within the workplace, um, yes, to reach out to our community, but also to look at and this is a passion of mine, I know it's coming up later in your agenda, but building well-being into the workplace because well-being and stress, stress as Siobhan pointed out is important, it's, it's there, but overwhelming stress and, and burnout in the workplace is a real issue with patient care, uh, with quality of care, with quality of outcomes, we know all that and it's about uh, recognizing that and building well-being into the uh, workplace. It, well-being is not, the, is it a responsibility of the individual, it's also the responsibility of the workplace, big and small. It's also a responsibility of all our stakeholders, the, the regulatory bodies, the departments, the, 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 the politicians. So, um, so it's about funding that, funding and uh, facilitating mental health first aiders within the workplace. That's brilliant, Rose. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we're going to move on now to our last speaker. So that is Mark Kavanagh from the PSNI. Hello, Mark. Hello, everybody. Good morning. How are you? We're doing good, I think. Um, Mark, could you explain to us um, what your job role is in the PSNI and sort of the work that you and your team are doing at the minute? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, let, let me just say a uh, big thumbs up to Emily, yourself and Sarah and the team for putting the conference together. Really fantastic to be invited along. And, you know, from what I can see so far, you've, you've done a fantastic job. Um, I kind of feel for those who are, are present and probably most will be too young to remember this and remember the whole Sesame Street thing. But I kind of feel a wee bit like uh, one of these people are not like the other. And that's, that's me. I'm not, a, I'm not a health professional. But I am a police officer, um, and I've been a police officer now for just over 30 years. Uh, in that time, uh, and certainly for the past five years, I have been the operational PSNI lead for mental health and the lead police officer for the development of the MAP team, which again, you will hear uh, more about uh, in, in due course. So my, my role overall then essentially is to uh, have a bird's eye view of the types of calls that the police receive, um, either by the emergency travel nine number or the, the, the 101 number. Um, I would look at the, the spread of calls, the volume of calls, um, really the type of calls that, you know, that obviously police are asked to respond to um, and then try and uh, make recommendations or uh, approaches on how we can provide a better frontline service. All that uh, is on sort of the back of bearing in mind that um, the mental health order now being 35, plus years old, it's looking to try to develop new approaches um, and look at things basically in a different light with a, a fresh pair of eyes and how we can uh, improve how we provide frontline policing services when people sort of need the most. And clearly um, what we're seeing so far is that that can only happen with good collaborative working. Yeah, that's brilliant, Mark. It sounds so interesting in um, the work you do. Um, I really want to talk more about the MAP team, but I think I'll leave that now just because we're a bit pushed for time and we have the presentation after this section. Um, the last question I just wanted to ask your opinion on was um, in the mental health strategy that was released in December, um, it mentioned how there are higher rates of mental health in areas with like high rates of social deprivation. Um, and I was just wondering, is that something that yourselves and your colleagues in the PSNI are aware of and is there strategies around that to sort of improve that issue? It's, I know it's like really complex and multifactorial, but um, is that something that you are looking at or? Uh, well, well, certainly, you, you know, as I've said already, you know, the spread sort of scale of the, the volume of calls, you know, that's something I have a particular interest in and yes, you know, we are looking about that. Um, you know, there's no doubt there is evidence that suggests that, that social deprivation does play a, a big part. But we, what we find um, as a policing service anecdotally is that realistically, mental health will affect anybody anywhere at any time. 
Um, so, you know, we will have calls that are mental health related, you know, from one end of the social spectrum to the other. So I wouldn't just be drawn and comment and saying that, you know, our focus is on, you know, the social deprivation aspect. Um, you know, again, you know, we're a service for all, essentially. Yeah, that's brilliant, Mark. That's a really good point. Um, I think we'll have to leave it at that. I would love to talk more to everyone in more detail, but um, we've definitely got the conversation starting. So this has been brilliant. And thank you so much, everyone, um, for coming this morning. Um, 